For months, in the year 1900, people in Manchester and the surrounding areas lived in fear. People began being rushed to hospital, extremely unwell, some with paralysis. And then came the deaths. But they all seem to have one thing in common. Thirty-eight-year-old Alice Riley left her home of 176 Lodge Street, Queen's Road, and made her way to work. But she was finding it difficult, as she'd been feeling really unwell. And as she thought about it, she had been slowly getting worse for a few weeks. <coughs> but she shrugged it off and carried on, as she decided it would just be the flu. And besides, Alice and her husband John really needed the money. After a long day at work, when she finally got home to her husband, she was feeling much, much worse. The usual sickness and pains she had been suffering for a few weeks were still there, but now she was starting with pins and needles in her hands and feet. She sat there, in her chair, across from her husband. He was sat with the paper in his hands, as if he was about to read it, but instead was looking past it, watching his wife, concerned, who was rubbing her knees looking extremely uncomfortable. He asked her if she was okay. She just replied that it's probably rheumatism in the joints. But within a week, Alice first lost the use of her feet and then her legs. Now bedridden, she was taken to Crumpsall Workhouse Infirmary where she deteriorated rapidly and sometimes seemed as if she was out of her mind. A few days later, Alice Riley was dead. But staff started noticing something strange going on when Alice and two more women, Margaret McCabe, who was 52, and 40 year old Jane Dyer, who both worked at Crumpsall Workhouse, who had also died of this mysterious condition. And one of the strange symptoms that staff had noticed was the change of the women's complexion, with the skin turning darker. And it was this symptom of skin discoloration which helped one doctor, Ernest Reynolds, find out what was the cause of this growing epidemic. By the time of December, over 2,000 people had been reported seeking medical attention with illness or paralysis, and sadly 70 so far had died. But now, thanks to Ernest, medical staff knew what they were up against. Ernest, who worked in the Crumpsall Workhouse Infirmary, had made a connection between the people who were ill. He noticed people who drank whiskey and spirits seemed to be okay, where the people drinking beer and stout were the worst affected. So on the 17th of November 1900, Ernest walked around Manchester, collecting samples from all the pubs he was informed by his patients that they went to. And by the next day, November the 18th, he performed Reinch's test, which is where the sample is put in an acid solution with a copper foil that's placed in a liquid. This is then heated to indicate whether there is a substance present or not. Ernest lifted the first beaker to the light and sighed. His theory had been confirmed. It turns out that some brewing companies, to keep costs low, replaced high quality barley malt with low quality barley malt and they supplemented this with sugar. And this sugar that was used was from Messrs Bostock and Company Limited, based in Garston, Liverpool. In the sugar refining process, sulfuric acid is used. But the acid purchased by Messrs Bostock and Company Limited, it had also contained another ingredient, arsenic, which remained in the final product, the sugar. Dr Reynolds' research confirmed it was through drinking poison beer that his and the thousands of other patients across the northwest of England had become ill by ingesting arsenic. Following the revelation, experts visited Manchester breweries and uncovered traces of the deadly poison in the inverted sugar that had been added to the brew. The outbreak of the poisonings was so serious that a royal commission, which is the public inquiry, was ordered to investigate, where there was a huge uproar and it was argued that companies 
were careless of the most elementary principles of honesty, so long as they can squeeze a little extra profit out of the transaction. Also following this discovery, breweries poured thousands of barrels of beer into the city sewers. Most breweries and public houses acted responsibly, like Manchester Brewery, Groves and Whitnall, who sent telegrams out to all the pubs that had purchased their beer to tell them not to sell the product. But some breweries were hit with fines for their slow response to the crisis, and one pub was even fined for still selling contaminated beer despite being notified of the presence of arsenic. In Lancashire, 23 pubs and taverns were prosecuted for violations related to the selling of contaminated beer. Records say at least 6,000 people were affected in the northwest. A large number died of heart failure, which is attributed to arsenic poisoning. And the following year, there was a considerable decline in the birth rate noted in Manchester, Salford and Liverpool. And this was attributed to the epidemic. Well, that will do it for this episode. But when interviewed, Ernest simply said, everything seemed to point to the fact that the poor people have been drinking poor beer. And another interesting point I found, at the Manchester Courier at the time, reported more women seemed to be affected than men. I was curious to why this might be, but I didn't find anything. Maybe you could let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and let me know what you thought of this event. Also, if you're new here, don't forget to like and subscribe, I upload true dark and mysterious stories of Manchester's past every Wednesday. Thank you for your support and take care.